Okay, I'm Alex here at Tropical Acres Farms in West Palm Beach, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about mango breeding, a subject that I get asked about periodically by people that are, you know, very interested in mangoes and want to know how new varieties come about and if any efforts are being made to produce new types of mangoes now in you know, 2024 and going forward. Uh, and it's uh, a very fascinating topic and one which has lots of pitfalls because of all the factors that come into play when you're making a decision on how to hybridize mangoes and what purpose you're seeking in terms of what you're trying to achieve with them. And um, there is a history of hybridizing mangoes in Florida that dates back at least a hundred years in terms of intentional hybridization programs. Now, most of the varieties selected here in Florida and most of the varieties around the world were not products of intentional breeding programs. Most of them were what we would call chance seedlings. That means that it was just a mango that came up from a seed in somebody's yard or on somebody's property, uh, sometimes planted on purpose, many times not but which was found to have desirable traits that made it worthy of replication. A breeding project or a hybridization program is a little different because it's an organized effort to try to produce new varieties, new hybrids, where a lot of times the parents are recorded and controlled for and the uh, progeny are studied over a period of years to figure out what traits they have that might make them desirable to turn into a cultivar that's replicated and grafted. So the first effort uh, that I can think of uh, was what Captain Hayden did when he planted all the seeds of the Mulgoba fruit that he had bought in West Palm Beach and brought back to modern coconut grove. Um, Hayden was kind of a, uh, an amateur horticulturalist, if you will. Well, he didn't do it as a career, but he became a hobbyist. And, um, back then there was very few mangoes in Florida in 1902. Not many varieties, at least that were established. They were attempting to introduce varieties from overseas for the most part. And so Captain Hayden planted... Um, I think like four dozen or so Hayden seedlings as kind of an experiment, planted them in the orchard formation to see what would happen. And after he died, uh, his wife took care of the trees, and when they fruited about eight years later, they were able to start evaluating some of them, and one of them became what we now know as the Hayden mango. Um, now, some would say that wasn't really a proper hybridization experiment or what have you, um, but it kind of falls in line with the way hybridization programs are conducted. Uh, later on, Edward Simmons, uh, who was the head of the USDA in Miami at one point in time in the 19-teens and early 20s, decided to actually do a controlled hybridization program where he recorded the, ma the maternal parent, the variety which it was a seedling of, and the speculated paternal parent the pollen parent. And actually, Edward Simmons tried to hand pollinate these uh, new hybrids and uh, with some success, apparently. And uh, he did not name these, but he came out with several hybrids. A couple of them were hybrids of the Hayden and the Philippine mango, or the Carabao, as we also know it. And I believe some of them were hybrids of Saigon and an Indian type called a Mini. So... Uh, and he probably did some others as well. And um, unfortunately, he passed away in the 1930s before he was able to see how these hybrids turned out. But he was trying to achieve something. He was trying to combine the flavor of these Indian-descended mangoes, like Hayden, which had uh, Indian parentage in the form of the Mulgoba, with Southeast Asian mangoes that at the time were thought to have better disease tolerance than the Indian types. So he was trying to get a little bit of the best of both worlds. And uh, in breeding projects, that's usually what you're trying to achieve is get some positive parents 
I'm sorry, positive attributes from both lineages that are coming from the different parents. So um, one of the results of Edward Simmons' um, uh, project was a mango that we now call the Edward. It was named by the Sturrox, who, you know, the, the family still owns this property today. Uh, David Sturrock was friends with Edward Simmons, and he was able to go and rescue these hybrids from uh, Mr. Simmons' uh, homestead, where his uh, widow still lived, and brought them here to West Palm Beach. He took uh, material and grafted new trees over here. And um, they knew that the Edward was so special it needed a name, so of course they named it after Mr. Simmons. They also named another mango from his project after him called the Simmons. This was another uh, Hayden by Carabao cross. But the one that became popular was the Edward, and that is the tree behind us. So Edward, um, you might say, is the first successful progeny of a controlled hybridization program for mango in Florida, conducted almost 100 years ago. But there was other programs that came later on. Uh, the aforementioned David Sturrock uh, decided he wanted to try to improve upon um, Mr. Simmons's improvement, and he hybridized the Edward with the with the Philippine uh, and some other mangoes like the Kent, and came up with some new hybrids in the 1950s and 60s. Beyond that, there was not a lot of mango breeding done in Florida, at least successful mango breeding, uh, for many decades. And so most of the Florida varieties that came into existence during the 20th century were chance seedlings. And uh, we got plenty of good ones, but it wasn't until uh, Gary Zill decided to try his hand at breeding that we got a lot of the newer, more modern hybrids that we get to enjoy now, um, starting in the uh, 1990s, early 90s, I believe, uh, Gary started to plant a lot of seeds and he continued to do so actually until the early 2000s. And um, Gary deliberately selected certain types of mangoes for his program because he was trying to achieve some special flavors and get some really exciting varieties, more exciting than what we're accustomed to here in Florida. And Gary's uh, program resulted in, uh, well, thousands of seedlings, um, only a, number, a fraction of which were kept uh, based on their flavor traits, based on their productivity, disease resistance, and other factors as well, but most importantly, flavor. And uh, some of the hybrids that he made, he didn't even intend to keep, but uh, other people, uh, including his brother or Richard Campbell um, and other folks, uh, thought they were worthy of replication. So examples of that were the Honey Kiss, um, and the Sessi Love and a few others that came out of Gary's program that uh, other horticulturalists were like, well, this is certainly worth keeping. So even some of the ones that Gary was going to discard made it out of the program. But a number of the ones he selected were very popular mangoes. Uh, so uh, that program was mostly about flavor and uh, productivity and disease resistance were kind of secondary factors, but certainly got consideration. So. Uh, other than that, um, since then, there hasn't really been any big hybridization programs that I'm aware of conducted uh, in the private sector. Uh, the USDA in Miami does try to, uh, or has tried to do some hybridization um, and breeding with mango, but it's not very public and not very well publicized. Uh, so, other than that, most of the hybridization programs with mango now occur in other countries where mangoes are a little bit more intensely studied than in the United States. So places like India, uh, Israel has done quite a bit of uh, mango breeding, Australia, South Africa are some places that uh, some pretty serious um, hybridization experiments have gone on in the last several decades. Um, and then in terms of what how you would design a breeding program for mangoes, it really comes down to what your goals are. So most of these programs around the world are geared towards commercial producers, people with many, many acres of mangoes that are going to be selling them for export, or at least in pretty large volume. They're not geared towards small producers or backyard producers. So here in Florida, 
if it were me designing a breeding program, it would be quite different potentially from traits that are being sought after by uh, some of the programs overseas. So things that you might consider when designing a breeding program, um, factors that are important, at least to us here, number one, certainly flavor matters a lot. I think there's a minimum threshold that a mango should have these days if you were expecting it to uh, get accepted on a wide level because there's a lot of competition in terms of flavor between varieties and it's a lot harder to impress these days uh, when it comes to, uh, to flavor and eating quality on mangoes because some people might say, well, it just has to be fiberless and sweet you know, at a very basic level, and that hurdle was something that was cleared many, many decades ago. So now you've got mangoes that have citrus and coconut flavor, or, um, you know, some of the really intense into Chinese flavored ones and whatnot. So that's a, a higher threshold to clear than it was for the folks breeding mangoes 100 or at least even 50 years ago or less. So, um, but flavor matters. So we would say probably that a threshold to clear on that would be if we're going to rate them on like a one through five scale the new variety really should at least be a four or better out of five right optimally closer to five um, the other thing here is in Florida we have a real dearth of early early season mangoes and very late mangoes we have a pretty good quantity of regular early season middle season mangoes uh, that are maturing in the summer, but not a lot of fruit is available during the spring months of the year. So March, April, and part of May, there's an opportunity for mangoes to be produced. And we have varieties like the Edward, the Dwarf Hawaiian, uh, the Rosy Gold, and the Rosa, which consistently will fruit in spring for us, but that's not a long list compared to all the mangoes that we are able to grow here. And similarly, for really late season varieties, it's a pretty short list. You have mangoes like Milam and Beverly and Kit. Um, now some newer varieties like M4 can make it pretty late, you know, into September, sometimes even October. But like August, September is when the mango season really winds down and there's pretty much no mangoes left by some point in September. So uh, on the bookends of the season, there is an opportunity for more varieties to exist than currently exist. And one would probably say that if you could find a mango that can fruit consistently in March or April, then the other factors that apply to selecting it aren't as important. Things like disease resistance, even flavor, um, you know, shelf life, overall productivity. Those are important factors, but if you can get a mango that fruits the bookends of the season, um, it's just another one to add to a pretty short list. Whereas when we're dealing with mangoes that are occurring in the earlier middle parts of the mango season, normally, now you've got a lot more competition and that mango needs to bring something to the table that the other mangoes don't. And I would say that some of the flavor groups that we don't see a lot of representation of that could use more are citrus and coconut. So even though we have these mangoes occurring during the regular season that have that flavor, it's not a wide group like it is with classically flavored mangoes or Thai mangoes um, or even the Indo-Chinese types. Those have a much wider selection of existing varieties compared to the citrus and coconut flavored types. So that's an area of opportunity uh, for a breeding project to develop some more varieties and more options for people that are seeking those classes of flavor. Um, other traits to consider are shelf life, um, I would say for the modern Florida grower, disease resistance is very important. So not just resistance to one disease, but multiple, powdery mildew and anthracnose. Especially with all the people that are growing mangoes in more humid areas uh, where, uh, you know, got more disease pressures. We need more varieties that we can recommend to people that are growing mangoes in Naples or Loxahatchee or Orlando. Sanford or whatever uh, because currently when a customer comes to a nursery asks for a mango tree um, if they're in a humid area it's harder for us to give them a recommendation with a shorter list so 
uh, it would be good to develop more disease-resistant varieties and more naturally productive varieties that flower re regularly. Here in South Florida in particular, we have an issue with very warm, mild winters now, and certain varieties don't flower well under those conditions. They want more cold air to stimulate a bloom. So probably a good goal of a, a, a breeding program in South Florida would be to find varieties that flower easily and produce plenty of female flowers because one of the most common complaints I see with some people growing certain varieties of mangoes such as Carrie um, and a few others is that the trees flower but they come out with a bunch of male flowers that can't make fruit. So if you're evaluating hybrids, one of the things to look out for would be are they making a good ratio of female flowers when they're flowering? Not just how frequently do they flower and how easily do they flower. So that's something to look at um, because a lot of the hybrids that came out of, uh, out of Gary Zill's uh, breeding program, as good as they taste, a few of them do struggle with uh, excessive male flower production. An example would be Sugarloaf, wonderful mango, uh, one of the best you'll ever eat. But uh, absolutely, as a small tree, makes a disproportionate amount of male flowers. So uh, imagine a sugar loaf mango that uh, made plenty of females. It would be pretty awesome, right? There's other things that we can look at too, like uh, resistance to bacterial black spot, which is a disease issue in southeast Florida, um, but not necessarily in, in all other areas. Uh, you can take a, a mango that has already really exceptional flavor and try to maybe uh, make the canopy a little smaller. So like, for example, there's uh, one of our, our favorite varieties is the CAC mango. That's a very aggressive tree. It'd be wonderful to have uh, a smaller example of that variety. And in some ways we do because like, for example, Sassy Love is a dwarfer. Uh, into Chinese hybrid type flavor, but it's a little different from the CAC in, in other respects because it's a smaller fruit. So um, lots of things to look at when you're trying to improve upon existing varieties. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty broad subject. And um, I would say uh, the, the, the easiest thing to find, well, not easiest to find, but like uh, the one trait which supersedes the other traits that I've been talking about is finding mangoes that mature exceptionally early and exceptionally late because then it's a much smaller pool that um, that they are competing against compared to the mid and regular season mangoes. So those are my thoughts on uh, mango hybridization uh, in 2024.